Welcome back to CBC News Network. I'm Chris Glover. Every day, about 25 people in Canada are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. That is more than one person every hour. Across the country, according to Parkinson's Canada, there are more than 100,000 Canadians living with the disease, including CBC veteran journalist Harry Forrestell. He was diagnosed in 2015, and although there are no known cures, there are life-changing treatments, and Harry underwent one of them. We'll talk all about it in just a second. But Harry, first of all, nice to see you. I wish you were here in person with me in Toronto, but it's nice to see you. How are you? How are you doing? How are you feeling? I'm doing great. Feeling really well. I'm feeling probably more in control of my body and my future than I have in quite some years. I was diagnosed back in uh, 2015, and it's been a long, a long path to this point where I, I feel, you know, more in control of myself than I have in many, many years. Take me back to that moment when you first learned about your diagnosis. What was your reaction at that point? Well, it was, you know, the diagnosis was something of a relief more than anything, Chris, um, in large part because I knew something was wrong with my body. My wife and I were sitting, sitting on the couch one night watching television, and I could feel my fingers twitching. And it was odd, and even Jenny noticed it and said, what's that? I said, I don't know. And as it got worse and I lost the ability to control my gait as I walked, swinging my arms, walking is something that you don't normally think about, but it be became a preoccupation for me in that I really did have to think about swing my arms in time with my legs as I walked or, or freezing, not being able to move, not being able to lift my feet off the floor. Uh, you know, walking through the doorway became a challenge because I was hyper aware of the door frame and would I bump into it? Could I get around it? Could I walk through it? So all of those things really messed with my head as well as with my body. You can imagine how difficult that would be. Yeah. And it's only been, yeah, exactly. And as, as we got closer and closer to a diagnosis, it became clear it was going to be one of three things, multiple sclerosis, uh, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is a horrible disease and, and a terminal one, or Parkinson's. So of the three, Parkinson's in many respects was a relief just to know what it was and what I could expect to have happen in the coming coming years. Yeah, and I know that they say that you, you die with Parkinson's, you don't die from Parkinson's, which certainly sounds reassuring given the other uh, potential situations that you might have been dealt. But at the same time, last December, you had this brain surgery, and you were awake during the surgery, which is difficult to wrap your head around, I think, for a lot of us, even if it's not painful. But what was that like, Harry? It was it was bizarre. I mean, I'm not afraid of hospitals. I'm not afraid of medical treatment. I've been a medical reporter in the past. I've been in and out of hospitals all my life. I trust science. I trust medicine. I trust doctors for the, for the most part. So going into hospital, I was more intrigued by what would happen and what it would feel like and, and what difference it would make and whether it would work or not. I was more intrigued than anything, Chris. And yet, even so, when I did get into the operating suite with this cage around my head that bolted to the, the gurney I was on to keep me immobile, um, and I could hear, you know, all through the process of preparation and pre-op treatment, I was told, now, we're going to drill into your head, and you're going to hear that. And oh it's going to be loud, be like an airplane taking off. And it was very much so, more like Concorde taking off inside my head. And uh, as they as they used a standard drill to create two holes in the top of my skull about the size of a nickel each, I could feel the pressure of that happening. And of course, I could hear the drill and the noise, which was compounded because it was in my skull. It was reverberating through my head. Once that was done, though, it was very calm, very quiet. Uh, as they inserted the probes that deliver the electrical impulses to the uh, basal ganglia of the brain, uh, I was aware of what they were doing, but I couldn't feel it because there are no pain sensors in the, in the brain, right? So the painful part of, of cutting through the scalp and lifting it back and drilling into the skull had, had already happened. Um, so beyond that, uh, the doctors were talking to me throughout the procedure, and I was quite chatty, apparently. I was curious about what was going on. 
you know, with me done. So I'm having a running conversation with the doctors about, well, how do you do that? How do you do this? There's a bank of computers at the back of the operating suite with, with uh, clinical personnel there who are tracking what the doctors are doing based on MRIs that I had had earlier in the day. So they're kind of giving the, the directions to the doctors so they know where to place the probes inside the brain. And to make sure they're getting to the right spot, they're asking me through the process, can you feel uh, you know, your little finger? Can you, is your thumb moving? Is your big toe moving? Can you feel a, a buzz in your leg? Uh, can you recite the days of the or the months of the year backwards, skipping every second month? <laughs> can you tell me the days of the week? Where year were you born? All these questions meant to help doctors get through the, you know, basically to skew the gray matter without damaging the important bits. And they succeeded beyond expectations with me. They hit the target on both hemispheres, both sides of the brain, uh, yeah. perfectly. Yeah, no yeah. kidding. And I want to I want to show everybody how how effective this all yeah. was, Harry, because you have this video that is really just stunning for people to see. First of all, you're using your cell phone in order to manipulate and control this device that was implanted into you. Let's watch this video together. So this is downloading information from a pack in my chest that is very much like a pacemaker, very small. And uh, in some cases, it has a rechargeable battery. Now I can feel my DBS, my deep brain stimulation therapy going off. And the reaction is almost immediate in that, in that I begin to shake and... It's so stunning to see that. And I was listening to you on The Current with Matt Galloway and you were telling him how emotional it was for you just to watch that video. Can you explain to me why was it so emotional for you to see it? Because really I had never seen myself without any medication there or any treatment. Uh, up to this point, I'd been taking levodopa, which is the most effective drug for Parkinson's at this point. And the brain synthesizes that into dopamine, which is the neurotransmitter that's necessary to send messages from the brain to various muscle groups around the body, where dopamine depletes or the cells that produce dopamine disappear as happens in Parkinson's you're no longer able to control those messages. Um, and uh, it was stunning to me to see that video because I had, I, I, I knew there would be a reaction. I didn't know how strong it would be. And to see myself as vulnerable as I was in that video uh, was, was striking. And even more so when I turned the device back on and all that shaking and all those symptoms, the tremors, they all subside immediately. I mean, it doesn't take two or three minutes. It happens right away, Chris. Mm. And it is remarkable. And Harry, just like you, I am always looking for stories, even when they're uh, affecting my own life. I'm not sure if during surgery I'd be speaking to the surgeon like you were there. But uh, <laughs> I love the fact that this happened to you, successfully so, and now here you are sharing your story with the nation to try to get some awareness around this. Can you tell me, why were you so motivated to do that? It's a fascinating story, first and foremost, and the fact that I'm at the center of it, I guess, makes it easier for me to tell that story. Uh, it's what we do, Chris, right? I mean, we, we look for opportunities to, to, to tell people about innovative thoughts, ideas, practices, uh, you know, treatments, cures, uh, illnesses. And the closer you are to the center being able to tell that story, the better you can tell it, I think. And that was the case with me. I just wanted to show people, you know, I refer to it as, you know, my party trick, which, which I guess reflects the idea that I take this very seriously, but I also appreciate not everyone can appreciate, can necessarily understand what it is people with Parkinson's they're going through. And I'm fortunate. I'm one of the lucky ones. Not everyone can experience this DBS, deep brain stimulation treatment successfully. You have to react well to levodopa, to the drug. Your body, if it is able to handle levodopa, will deal well with this electrical uh, stimulation process. Not everyone will be able to go through this for a, a whole variety of reasons. I'm, as I said, fortunate that I can and that I have gone through it, and it's changed my life. So, um, yeah, in the end, it's, it's just a fascinating story, whether it's about me or, or somebody else. 
Fascinating story indeed. And Harry, I'm so grateful to see that you're doing well and to have you on the program this morning. Nice to see you. Good to see you. You take care. Harry Forstel is the host of CBC News, New Brunswick.